Thank you. Uh, my compliments to Sebastian, who I've just met because he's just flown in from Hong Kong and arrived a few hours ago to deliver that. So uh, he, has, he has my appreciation for that. I also met him to explain, uh, not apologize, but explain, I'm neither an academic nor an economist. So you, this is what you're going to get. So my, my comments are going to deal with a lot of the policy implications of the work, the policy context, and focus more not on the methodology, I'm not qualified to comment, but on the housing model itself that was being investigated, because that's, that's the issue of interest uh, from, where, from where I'm sitting. I'm going to put my books here and hope it doesn't... So the reason why I like this paper is, firstly, the region, and I'm going to explain why the region is important. We're a global organization, and so we look at the lessons from Latin America elsewhere in the world. The substance, the, 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 the housing issue, uh, which continues to be one of the most in intractable problems for many, many governments. And I really like the fact that we now have lots of academics uh, going through slums and doing analytical studies. This is what we have been, this is a sign of the, the issue being taken seriously uh, in, a, in a real manner. And the reason why Latin America is so important is it was, of course, the first of the so-called developing continents to urbanize over the last five decades and holds very important lessons, positive and negative, for Africa and Asia, which are in different stages of the same process. It was a very messy urbanization. It was a contested urbanization. It largely happened under hostile governments, military governments, right-wing governments, but certainly it was not an enabling environment for urbanizing poor. Uh, it led to, one of the consequences, of course, was a massive growth in slums and informality, and structural inequality, which still remains, one of the biggest uh, economic, social, political challenges for all of the governments. And those lessons are all needed to be understood uh, in Africa, South Asia, and Southeast Asia as they urbanize. So the intervention that Sebastian describes um, uh, is, in my mind, a, a very limited shelter intervention. And I want to stress the limitations of this intervention in a complex and, stratify, and stratified housing or residential and labor market. And that complexity comes through in, in much of the treatment. But I want to argue the policy lessons from this are limited. And, and they're limited for, uh, the, there's two areas that I would like to see further elaborated. The first is, uh, even though I read the paper and from the presentation, I never understood the, the model of techno, the, this, the NGO, what it was doing and, and, and why, and what its financial model was, what was the objective, besides the charitable, uh, it seeming, and volunteer and the, and the good effort, I never was able to locate it within a, a wider picture. And the second and, and more telling is, I think that there really is required a more holistic understanding of the policy and institutional environment within which this is taking place, because that is absolutely essential in order for it to be understood. This is going to be my wife. <laughs> no, it isn't, but anyway. Excuse me. Capture happen. But the reason why this case study is important, and it is important, because it is a case study of how millions of people have urbanized and are urbanizing, and the kinds of policy responses and project-based responses that still dominate a, a lot of the policy environment in the shelter and housing debate. So we had an, a very interesting discussion in this, but also in the previous, about the, the data as to why people move between space. I can't uh, articulate it in the way that it was says. This is at the center of our own work, which is understanding migration. But my, my response immediately is, is you can't lose a fact of, for me, that the number one driver of, of migration is human judgment which is that people take a, long, a view about their opportunities and multi-generational view of what's maybe good for them but also good for their children. And for those of you who have never read it, I think uh, a, a book called Arrival City by Doug Saunders, very, uh, without, without the sort of economistic um, evidence, interpreted the driving forces for the migration that we see in Latin America. Uh, Asia and Africa. So what the paper describes 
as I don't believe is in situ upgrading, and I'll explain why, but rather a limited project-based intervention uh, in, in shelter. But although, and my first policy uh, response to this would be, although that the financial model isn't explained beyond which 10% is paid for by the recipients, it's almost certainly non-sustainable financially, although I'd like to understand where the other 90% comes from. But policy challenge number one, it, it, I don't believe it can really go to scale. And scale is, is the, the big issue that we have to deal with in terms of urbanization and the creation of our new cities. So if I was to look at this from a policy framework, I would identify three catalytic triggers, which informs a lot of our own work, uh, which have to be addressed in order to deal with urbanization on a long-term and, and, and successful basis. And it, references are made in the paper, but I want to point out why they are problematic. By, by which I mean the project and not the paper. The first is land, and access to land and the location of land and the relationship to land. In all of our experience, in all continents, this is policy problem number one everywhere, without any competition. And until you have land markets that are open, uh, transparent as opposed to opaque, you know who bought it, how they got it, and how it can be transferred, and until you change the relationship of the people to that land, the, the prospects of, of uh, sustainable cities is really, really diminished. The second is related is the issue of services, access to services, and by which I, I stress formal access to services. So it's issues of, first of access and secondly of pricing, and I'll very briefly come back to that. And the third is I will, I will characterize as citizenship. It's an urban citizenship that I'm talking about, which is l a recognition of the rights of the urbanizing poor from the public authorities, however that is, is manifest. And, if, and we actually run a program, a lot of our work is, is described as LSC, Land Services and Citizenship, not because it solves all problems, but because it asks all questions. You start asking those questions and it triggers you into the governance issues, into affordability, into pricing. But if you don't address those three, and, and obviously my critique of the, of the model, not the paper, is it addresses none of them. Uh, it means that it is fundamentally flawed in the long term. And th the policy implications for this are very significant indeed and most probably best exemplified in Latin America and the Caribbean. Go back to citizenship. I would argue this recognition in some form or another is an absolutely essential precondition for household formation, for community cohesion, and ultimately for city building. The absence of, here's one of the golden, <laughs> the golden lessons that I use anecdotally from our evidence of this kind of slum upgrading environment. For every service, be it land, be it services of water, energy, whatever, and be it citizenship, for every service that is not formally provided, it will be informally provided. And that has two impacts, immediately on price, and I think we will all know uh, that the evidence shows that in the same city all over the world, generally speaking, in these sort of situations, the poor pay more per unit cost of, of consumption than the, the rich in the same city. And, that's, and one of the impacts of that is both the lateness to the service and, in fact, the fact that they have to buy it on a parallel market. But this becomes hugely problematic when issues like citizenship and governance are also dealt with parallel-wise. And, and so in many of the countries, you first require a process of pacification before you can actually move on to urban upgrading. And the failure of these projects to deal with the <laughs> a process of formalization and recognizing that the bulk of our urbanization processes actually are informal is at the core of the policy challenge that, that we need to take. So, but ironically, in the model employed by the NGO, not only do they not address the issue of land, and it's not their fault, but I'm just observing, but they even design the houses so that they, that they underscore the very transient nature of, of the housing stock. In other words, the, the, it's movable pricely because, because they don't have a formal relationship with the land and the law. And therefore, they underscore the very um, uncertain nature that we have to overcome in order to build uh, cities. So the paper finds, for example, that there are no positive impacts on, on access to services. 
uh, arising from these interventions. For me, it's not clear why they would be expected because you are not dealing with the land issues, you're not dealing with the services issues, and you're not dealing with the, the residents' relationship with uh, the public authority. And so, for all of its merits, this uh, intervention is far more, in my view, uh, a sort of charity enterprise than it is a developmental exercise, and therefore must necessarily be limited. Because let us place it into the wider housing policy context. And this is Latin America, but it's also Africa and Asia. And you'll allow me to generalize, but I, I'll be happy to be challenged on any of these generalizations. So despite government interventions in, in housing provision, there are a number of overriding realities, all of which start from my premise number one, which always causes the most trouble, which is that in all of our experience, you should start from the assumption that the default reality of government policy is anti-poor, no matter what the government says. Never mind, never mind what the speeches are. If you actually look at the practice of policy, they are not designed uh, to improve the quality of the poor. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that. But historically, most interventions in the housing field have uh, and continue to benefit largely the middle classes, whether by design or by outcome. Uh, I don't think that is controversial. As I've already stated, most growth is informal, but most governments re regard that informality is very often illegality and then respond accordingly. And then, and, but here is the key point, which is where I think fundamentally the model fails, is that most housing in the world today is still built by the poor themselves. And normally in the face of uh, government obstacles rather than with government support, intelligent governments have turned that around and have, and this has happened very much in Latin America, and provided the space, support, and time. And some private sector companies have even designed uh, delivery of credit and housing materials to support that very process. And for me, whenever I talk to the Honorable Housing Minister in whichever country, it's, it's taking that logic of the energy of the, and the self-interest of the people themselves and turning that into the biggest driver of what is ultimately a, a private sector and individual initiative in the, in the houses, in the, in, the, in the cities. Thank you. So, uh, what is so important about Latin America and the Caribbean is that so many of the lessons that could be learnt are being learnt only in very few countries. For example, and I'm, I'm deviating now, but just <laughs> is planning in advance of urbanization. So even though we talk about understanding why people move across space, anyone who's looked at the statistics across all continents knows that longitudinally the real message today isn't the fact that the world is more urban than rural. This is a message of 15 years ago. The real message is that by the end of the century, 85% of the entire world's population will be urban dwellers. And therefore, the question then becomes is, what policies and plans are we putting into place in order to achieve that? And that's where I come back to, again, not the paper, but the model. It is not grappling with, it, and, and to be fair to it, it doesn't, it doesn't pretend to grapple with the big issue of how the fact is that in most cities in where we work, the majority of the population are underserved, underserviced, underhoused, and of course underemployed. And therein lies the, the, the real battle of, of the challenges. Let me finish off with two observations. One on, the, on the, the indicators on children health where you did demonstrate that there was improvements uh, because of the shelter intervention in children's health. And that is welcome, but of course the key intervention that would really change children's lives would be water and sanitation. And, and, and again, it is highly problematic that we have housing interventions which are disconnected in more ways than one from the provision of, of services and the connection of, of, of services. Uh, but what I found, and of course the propensity to improve access to or the purchase of durable goods, I found a very interesting observation and I want to take it to, I now look at two extremes of the housing policy debate. On the one hand, for those of you who followed housing policy debates in the last decade and a half, will know that very famously, Hernando de Soto uh, put forward a, a very compelling um, thesis, very often uh, misunderstood, often consciously so, uh, 
uh, whereby he argued, and here I am very much at one with him, that the real driver of change in these cities is going to be unleashing the power of the, of the poor themselves out of their own self-interest, etc. And I'm, I'm very much in, of that view. However, he reduced it, uh, if I simplify it, rather simplistically to a silver bullet, which was to focus not only on property rights, but within that, on titling. So that's one side of the equation. On the other side of the equation, we have housing provision with no attention to, to titling at all. Uh, on the others, because De Soto assumed that the titling would make people rich, and here it's assumed or it's tested that the shelter investment will improve people's conditions. And in both instances, after the policy intervention, the poor are still left poor, because the other variables which allow them access to jobs and opportunity actually haven't been addressed. And for me, the, the real policy danger is, is treating... Um, this one variable uh, and giving it an importance that I don't believe it deserves in the absence of looking at the wider picture. Thanks, Ed. Wonderful. Thank you.